Mr. Coates, and this is Apes Lecture number 15 on aquatic ecosystems. This is the freshwater side of things. Now, aquatic ecosystems are a very important planet. Obviously, 75% of the planet is covered with water, and most of this planet is an aquatic ecosystem. So we need to know a little bit about them. So we're going to look at the freshwater side of things first. And uh, you ever wonder why some plants or some animals live in different freshwater areas than others? different reasons for that. So we're going to look at all these different characteristics of different freshwater systems and find out why certain animals live where they do. So first of all, aquatic ecosystems have a lot of limiting factors to them. One of the most important limiting factors here is dissolved oxygen. Now in the atmosphere, we don't have to worry about dissolved oxygen because it's all around us. However, in aquatic ecosystems, dissolved oxygen has to diffuse into the water or it has to be put in there by plants. And in a lot of deep places, there's not enough light for plant life. So oxygen is usually at a premium in a lot of aquatic ecosystems. It is one of the most important limiting factors in aquatic ecosystems. Next thing is temperature. One of the things to know about water, when you go deeper, it gets colder up to a point. Water is its most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. However, when water starts to get colder than 4 degrees Celsius, it starts to rise again. So temperature is a huge limiting factor as well. You can have all these ranges of temperature in the ocean. However, certain organisms can't live at all these different temperatures. So that can be a limiting factor on certain organisms. Light is also an important limiting factor. In order to have photosynthesis, you must have light. And in order to have primary productivity, you must have photosynthesis. So if you don't have any light, then you don't have any primary productivity. And this is a huge problem, especially in open water bodies that are far away from land and far away from nutrients. The next limiting factor is pressure. Now most aquatic organisms don't have any air spaces in them and so they don't really feel pressure. However, those organisms that do have air spaces, things like mammals, sometimes some bony fish, and then of course humans, we have problems when it comes to pressure. And so pressure can be a limiting factor for some of those organisms. The last limiting factor is nutrients. As I mentioned earlier, the open ocean or sometimes open uh, water areas have low amounts of nutrients and therefore they don't have the primary productivity that other places do. Therefore, they don't have a whole lot of life. So all these things are major limiting factors, but remember, oxygen is number one here. Now when we talk about nutrients in lakes, sometimes the nutrients sink down to the bottom and sometimes they get stuck there for quite a while. One of the things that does happen in lakes, especially in northern climates, is what we call lake overturn. So during the winter, we'll start over with this diagram here. Remember, the, usually in northern climates, the pond or the lake freezes over on the surface. So the surface is usually the coldest part of the lake. Remember, however, that I said that water is its most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. So as you go down in the water body, it usually gets warmer in this case, which is quite different than it does during the summer. The good thing about this is that water does freeze and it does float. And so that means all the life that is down here can survive. Now, what happens when it becomes spring? We start to warm up this zero degree area. And once again, because four degrees Celsius is more dense than anything below it, it starts to sink. So this four degrees Celsius water at a point starts to sink. When this starts to sink, this pushes bottom water up. This bottom water has been stuck at the bottom all winter long. It's probably picked up some of the nutrients that were uh, locked in the bottom area and it brings them to the surface. So that's one of the positive things about overturn is that it recycles nutrients. Also, it recycles oxygen. So these waters up here are highly oxygenated and it can bring those down to the deeper parts of the freshwater system. Now in summer, what we get is what we call stratification. This means that the water body divides itself up into different layers based on temperature. So at the surface, obviously, it's the warmest. As we go deeper, then we see the normal stratification of getting colder as we go down until we get down, if it gets 4 degrees Celsius, at its coldest at the bottom. Now, when fall comes around, we have another turnover event. Okay, This warm water starts to cool down. And what happens is that it starts to fall then because it gets colder, and that pushes this cold water back up, and you get another nutrient in uh, fusion here. And so this is lake overturn and it can be very beneficial to bringing nutrients and dissolve oxygen back up to the surface 
where the light is and so you can get primary productivity. Now one of the most important freshwater ecosystems are rivers and streams. These are moving water ecosystems. Now moving water ecosystems have uh, what we call zones. So the first zone, when a river first starts out, it usually starts out as a creek. Even the mighty Mississippi starts out as a creek somewhere. You can walk across it. The Mississippi is small and you can walk right across it in those areas. This is called the source zone or the headwaters of the river. Usually in this area you're uh, up in a high altitude and the water usually runs down the slope of the mountain or the hills that it originates in fairly quickly. The water is fairly clear, very clean, it's well oxygenated because it flows over rapids like this picture down here and uh, so the organisms that live here are highly adapted to clear, clean, cold and well oxygenated water. A good example is trout. Rainbow trout are uh, very much part of this type of ecosystem. They are almost a indicator species for uh, clean, fresh water, cold ecosystems. Now as the river flows down and the land starts to level out, we start to get into the midsection here. Okay, and we get what we call the floodplain. The floodplain is this area right here. What happens when we have the spring thaw up in the mountains, we get periodic floods down a river. All rivers flood. So when that happens, the river overtops a bank and it fills in this floodplain and drops lots of sediment in these areas. This sediment is high in nutrients. This is why a lot of our farming in the Midwest is right around the Mississippi River in the floodplain because all of this river drops these important nutrients and it's very good for agriculture. However, it's not so good for building on. Unfortunately, we do like to build on floodplains, and just like the name implies, if you build on a floodplain, chances are eventually you're going to be flooded. So as the river flows down the floodplain, the river starts to widen out. The clarity gets uh, lower, so it gets muddier down here. It gets warmer, so you don't see in those trout anymore. Those trout are gone now. They're stuck back up in here. You start seeing things like catfish and bass, fish that can handle these conditions. Then we get out to the mouth of the river, and the mouth usually divides up where it has several different islands, and these islands are built by all the sediment that flows down the river. And this is called the delta area, or the mouth of the river. Sometimes this empties out into a, a saltwater body, and so you get an estuary in this area. And an estuary is where the freshwater mixes with the saltwater, and we'll talk about that when we talk about saltwater ecosystems. Now the other type of freshwater ecosystem out there is called is lakes and ponds. Now there are two main types of lakes and ponds. The first kind is oligotrophic. Oligotrophic is a type of lake that is very clean, clear water. It usually has steep slopes. It usually has a rocky bottom. There's not a whole lot of plants around the edges of a lake like this. And there's not a whole lot of nutrients that flow into this lake. So you don't have a whole lot of primary productivity. The lake is very clear. It's the kind of lake you kind of want to go swimming in all the time. That's an oligotrophic lake. The other type is eutrophic. Now here in Florida, we tend to have more eutrophic lakes than anything. Eutrophic lake tends to have high nutrients, and by nutrients we mean nitrogen and phosphorus. Phosphorus are the two main nutrients when it comes to water bodies. And so we get water bodies down here in Florida that look like this with algae on top. They have lots of plant life in the edges. They have emergent vegetation, cattails, lily pads. And uh, so this is a classic example of a eutrophic lake with lots of nutrients here. Now there are two types of eutrophication. There's natural eutrophication that happens on its own. And that goes, and that's results in this in the succession process of this pond. Eventually this will fill in with all kinds of debris and nutrients and eventually become more swamp-like and eventually become dry land. That will take quite a long time of course, but uh, that's the succession process of a pond with high nutrients. The other type of uh, eutrophication is what we call cultural eutrophication. And cultural eutrophication is caused by humans. And that's when we over fertilize in our areas or we pollute and these pollutants get into these ponds and lakes and create our algae blooms like the one we see here. And we create eutrophic conditions. So those are the two types of lakes. Now just like streams, lake ecosystems are divided into zones. 
The first zone is up here, the littoral zone. The littoral zone is a zone where the water actually meets the land. And like I said, you see these emergent vegetation, the cattails, you see grasses, lily pads. This is where you get most of the primary productivity in a lake or a pond is in this area. You have lots of organisms that live here, lots of insect larvae, lots of small fish that find shelter in here. And uh, this zone is very important to the productivity of the lake. As we get away from that, then we, the bottom starts getting deeper where no sunlight can reach there. So we don't have any emergent plants or submerged plants in this area. This is called the limnetic zone. And that's in the middle of the pond or the lake. Now, if we're talking about a big lake, the limnetic zone can be huge, like the Great Lakes. So those are the two main zones in lakes or ponds. Now, as we go deeper, we lose light. Water is a very good absorber of light. And as you go deeper, the light starts getting more dim and more, more dim. So the area where we have light is called the photic zone. Photic means light. The area where we don't have light is called the aphotic zone or the no light zone. Usually this zone is very cold, very dark, and organisms that live down here usually don't make it up to the surface because they can't stand those conditions. In a lake, this area then is called the profundal zone. It's the cold, dark area of a lake. Profundal. Now the other zone that is in all aquatic ecosystems is called the benthic zone. The benthic zone is the bottom and so it's this entire area no matter how deep, how shallow, and this uh, harbors all kinds of organisms in it. Any organism that lives on, like this crayfish here, or in, like worms, are called benthos. And so benthic animals uh, provide an important base of the food chain along with all the phytoplankton that occurs up here. And a lot of these are decomposers and they help cycle nutrients within your pond or lake. Now other freshwater ecosystems include swamps and bogs. Here in Florida we have cypress swamps. Uh, in northern climates we have more of a boggy type freshwater ecosystem here instead of a swamp. Um, in Florida, uh, our cypress trees love to grow in water. However, a lot of times this water area that's in here is anoxic. That means it has no oxygen. And, and because it's anoxic, cypress trees build these knees, which are actually modified roots. They actually grow these up out of the water, and these are used for gas exchange between the atmosphere since there's not a whole lot of dissolved oxygen underneath all this other vegetation. And so we see these quite a lot in our freshwater ecosystems here in Florida. Now when we get into a bog situation, we don't have any trees. The northern climates typically don't have a lot of trees standing right in the water. And so we get more mosses in this area, like sphagnum moss. And uh, over time, these areas, all this moss rots and more moss grows on top of it, and you get this huge buildup of organic matter at the bottom of these uh, swampy areas. Eventually that will turn into peat, and eventually, if peat is in the ground long enough, will turn into coal. And this is a freshwater bog. You find a lot of these in Ireland and in uh, Great Britain. All right, the last freshwater ecosystem I want to talk about are ephemeral ponds. Ephemeral ponds are a little bit different than swamps and bogs. Most of the time, ephemeral ponds are dry. Only during the rainy season are these ponds actually wet. Ephemeral ponds are a very important ecosystem because there are a lot of organisms that are specifically adapted to these ponds. I know there are some amphibians out there that only reproduce when these ponds appear. And when they disappear, these amphibians bury themselves in the dirt where this pond is and don't emerge until the pond becomes wet again. You find them here in Florida. I hope that helps you understand freshwater ecosystems. Stay tuned for saltwater ecosystems that will be coming up. And don't forget to have your question ready for class when these notes are due.